And this is the one that I think is going to surprise a lot of people. Hello and welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather. I just finished editing the video that you are about to see, but I didn't get a chance in the video to show you one of the most exciting things that I think we've had made for our website. You guys know who this is. If you don't, this is one of our dairy goats, Calamity. Calamity loves the camera. And so we have joked sometimes that this is the Calamity show. And so if you haven't used one of these before, you might not know what this is, but this is is a Swedish dishcloth. So you can use it for dishes. One of my favorite things to use it for is just general cleaning. You can use it a lot like you would use a paper towel and they actually buff stainless steel super, super well. One of these can replace up to 17 rolls of paper towels. You can wash it in the clothes washer or even in the dishwasher and I love them. And this one has calamity on it. So these are on the website as well as these super awesome, really high quality glitter stickers. So I've got them linked in this video so there's a good chance you're gonna see them right below the video right now if not you can visit the link in the description and with that please go enjoy the vlog so I've got a goat vlog for you today there's a couple things that we need to do to get ready for hay and for winter and this shed has something to do with that I am also going to reintroduce you guys to our dairy herd and talking about our call and our breeding plan. This is what it looks like. I'll make sense of this a little bit later. This shed was sent to us very graciously by the company called Patio Well. And I originally had said yes to receiving this shed because I really thought that we could put our rabbits in there, our breeder rabbits, and free up some space in our barn for hay. We really don't have much as far as hay storage goes. Right now, a lot of our hay is being stored kind of where I milk the goats and it is hard to move in the milking parlor for most of the year because of the hay. So this shed is six feet by eight feet and I do like it. One of the issues that I'm having with it though, one of the main issues that I'm having is that even when it's cool outside, it's oppressively hot in this little space. So I cannot put rabbits in it, but I can still use it to help us make room for hay. And that's what we're doing today. I do really like how sturdy it seems. At first when we were putting it up, it seemed kind of flimsy, but then as soon as we put in these beams at the top, it really helped sure up the structure. Now, as a lot of you know, we do have quite a wind issue here for part of the year. And so we do need to secure this down, but that's not what today's project is. <laughs> so we live right here in a small double wide trailer, the six of us, and we have a lot going on. Farms and homesteads take a lot of things sometimes, especially when you have dairy animals, there's a lot of odds and ends. You need kind of a decent amount of food storage. So we have quite a few outbuildings as you can see. And that really helps, really helps us manage what we can do here. One of the outbuildings that you see probably least often is this mower shed. There's quite a lot of space in here and it stays nice and dry. Theoretically, we could move some of our rabbits into this space and still utilize the barn for hay. But the guy that bales our hay really needs a lot of the hay gone today and I just don't have time to move the rabbits and get the floor cleaned up. So the plan is to clean out this mower shed into our new patio well shed. And then we're gonna put some hay in here. I think Levi is picking up 50 bales today. We need about at least 200 bales to get through winter here. We don't have the amount of space to store all of our winter hay, but in previous years, we have just been going to our hay guy once a month and picking up 30 bales, and this is gonna help alleviate the amount of trips that we have to take up there. I've put my veil on because there's quite a few wasps nests in this storage shed over here in the mower shed. I mean, the wasps are kind of jerks all year round, but especially in the fall time, the wasps get a lot more aggressive and I don't want to get stung in the face. I forgot my dump trailer had a flat tire. Oh well. I know that all of these tools and implements have ways that you can kind of fold in the like push bars here. I don't have to worry about it right now, thankfully, but it, when we need to, these things can just fold up and we'll have even more space in here. 
If you are in need of a little bit extra storage space somewhere around your home, go ahead and visit the link in the description box and in the pinned comment. Don't forget to plug in our coupon code if you decide to make a purchase. Thank you so much to Patio Well for sponsoring today's video. Levi did some calculations and he said that if we filled this to the top or wall to wall, floor to ceiling that we could fit, I think over a hundred bales of hay in here, which is really awesome. But as I mentioned, he's picking up 50 bales today. So I think that cleaning out half of this shed is going to be more than sufficient. But you can see we do have a gravel floor in here. And so when he gets back from picking up the hay, the first thing he has to do is build a rack so we can elevate the hay up off of the ground so it doesn't mold. While we're waiting for Levi to get back with the hay, we'll go over all of our lovely dairy goats, reintroduce you to them, talk about who is staying and who is going and kind of what this all means. <laughs> so right now on our farm, we have 30 goats out there as far as I can recall. I hope I'm not missing anybody, but this is a list of all of our goats. I know it looks really confusing. I'm gonna put pictures on the screen and hopefully we can make sense of all of this together. But we have five main goats that we started out with on our farm. We first started with dairy goats in 2020 and my first set of goats came from Living Traditions Homestead. From their herd, I bought Rory and I bought Pepper. Rory came with her two kids, which was Barely and Tumnus. I still have Barely. And then I bought a buck that year, Barley. I don't have Barley anymore. He looked a lot like Havoc, except for not with the moon spots. And he didn't put out as great quality of udder. So we passed Barley on pretty quickly. But that year I also bought Margie in the summer and I bought Shvenly. The next year I bought a whole bunch of La Manchas. Now out of the five La Manchas that I bought in 2021, I only have one left, it's Christine. Some of them we sold for attitude problems. Some of them unfortunately did pass away, but we still have Christine. So I have my main lines up here that I wanna discuss. We have our Rory line. I don't have Rory anymore, but if you see a brown goat out there, it's probably from my Rory line. We have our Pepper line and I call her Peppy. So I've got her listed as Peppy on here. We have the Margie line, the Shvenny line, and then the Christine line. This is kind of the basis of a lot of the herd that's out there. So from our original dairy goat Rory, I kept back two daughters. I've kept back Barely, who she came with. And I also kept Pesky out of her first kidding that she had on our farm. And her dad is that buck Barley that I talked about before. Now out of Barely from the Rory line, we've gotten Tempest and then Tempest gave birth to Mochi. Tempest is the Havoc daughter. Havoc is one of our main bucks that we have here. There's a lot of Havoc kids on here and that's because Havoc is a superstar. All superstars have a star by their name. Out of Rory's other daughter that I kept, Pesky, I did keep Titus from last November. Titus actually needs a highlight here. The highlighted goats are either for sure going to be culled or potential culls within the next year or 18 months. And Titus, because he's from my Rory line and he's out of havoc, he's just really redundant as far as genetics go. And with my new buck, Little Nefarious from Blue Cactus Dairy Goats, I really don't have much use for Titus, which is kind of sad. He's beautiful, he's got blue eyes, but I don't necessarily need him. Pesky is due to give birth in like 10 days and she currently is bred back to Havoc. So all of those kids I really don't plan on keeping unless she just gives me something that I can't resist, like a moon-spotted blue-eyed pulled doe. I mean, hard to resist really. So next up is our pepper line. I have started to fully call my pepper line sort of. So out of Pepper, we had a doe named Idolin that I moved on to GWP Homestead. She's called Eden over there. And the reason that I'm moving these goats on is Pepper, she's got a little tiny teat deformity. It's called a spur teat. And it's just this little tiny teat nub. It's non-functional, but unfortunately that deformity can and does pass on. And she's really good at throwing dairy goats with extra teats. And that's not something that we can register. And it's really not something that can be shown. And it's just not ideal. And with this many dairy goats, I can afford to be a little bit picky. Even though I really love her parasite resistance, she's been very low maintenance as far as the dewormers go. And even though I really like her udder quality, there's just, there's that big rub, that big black mark of the spur teat that I just need to erase out of the herd. So I have Pepper as a call here, as well as her son Odious that we kept back from, I think it was last year, 
because unfortunately we've seen that odious i've bred him to a couple other ladies he also does throw multi-teated kids now he doesn't necessarily throw all multi-teated kids i've heard a couple different schools of thought on this that you can breed out that bad quality and that you can't it's something that i'm still working on figuring out for myself Last fall, I paired Odie with a couple different ladies. I paired him with Tempest, and I paired him with Margie. And Margie's kids, she had triplets. None of them have multi-teats. So I did keep back her girls out of Odie, and we'll get to our Margie line in just a second. And my goal with them is just to see how they freshen, to see if they happen to have a little tiny spur teat that really can be missed on, you know, maiden udders and see what they produce because sometimes that defect can skip a generation and if they start to produce multi-teated kids they're going to go as well but i don't have them blacked off right here just because i need to wait and see so on to the margie line margie is an unregistered i think mini over hashley if i'm saying the name of that breed right she was sold to me as a nigerian but she does not have a nigerian udder she does not have nigerian milk quality and she's a little bit big, long leg. She looks like a mini ober. Out of my Margie line, which is one of my favorite lines, I have kept Tallulah and Holly, that is from this year, Mayhem from the first time she kitted here with me, and then Mayhem has had Boba, and Boba delivered Dingus this spring, and Dingus is part of our meat goat program, that's why he's got a highlight. As I mentioned, Margie had triplets this past spring. We kept Cholula and Holly like I talked about, but Bean Dip, the little boy out of the mix, he has a little family that he's going to this fall, so he's marked on our coat list. And this is the one that I think is gonna surprise a lot of people. I have Shvenli listed here. She's highlighted in yellow, which means that she is a cull along with both of her babies. So you've probably heard me really up talk Shvenli as far as her parasite resistance goes. And Shvenli is a very strong goat as far as that goes. Problem is that's literally the only thing that she has going for her. She's not amazing as far as temperament. She's not amazing as far as milk quality or capacity or the longevity that she's able to keep with her lactation. She's quite a narrow, thin and frail goat. I have bigger goats that really mean a lot more to me that have a lot more strength in the areas that she's weak. So I am going to call Shvenli this fall along with both of her babies. And that's jerk face and brown baby. <laughs> Next, moving on to Christine. Christine's registered name is actually Havana. It's been a nightmare trying to get her official paperwork. So Christine is a purebred La Mancha, but unfortunately with her line, I've had to treat her as a grade level. And if you don't know much about registering, that doesn't mean a whole bunch to you, but basically I have to start with the, from the ground up with that particular line, which, you know what, it's okay with me. I don't show or anything. I really like my registered goats, but it's literally not a deal breaker for me. Like I mentioned, my unregistered line, my Margie line, is definitely one of my favorites. So the paper really isn't everything. But out of Christine, I bred her to a buck that we had named Cash. Cash's only living offspring on my farm is Elpis and Elpis is absolutely a favorite. I've got these guys starred because they have the best quality big goat udder on the farm. Their udders are beautiful. And I really can't wait to see what Elpis's triplets produce as far as udders go. We kept back all of her dolings from the springtime. They are Havoc babies, Mini La Manchas, Shindy Tizzy, and Fury. Now I kept all of the mini La Mancha dolings that we had born on our farm this year. And that doesn't mean that they're going to stay forever. I really want to see them develop. I wanna see them freshen at least once. And then I can start to get picky with them a little bit later on as we grow our mini La Mancha herd. But most of the mini La Manchas are not getting bred this year. They're simply too small. So I'm gonna give them another year to grow bigger and be a lot more mature before I ask them to have babies. I have purchased some relatively new lines of goats in the last couple of years. We have some La Manchas, Talia and Calamity. You guys have seen them on the channel. Calamity loves to be a camera hog. We call this the Calamity Show from time to time. Calamity did deliver a little buckling out of havoc this springtime. Unfortunately, he did not live. I was really excited about keeping him and using him in my mini La Mancha program, but unfortunately we don't get to do that. So I've got this empty spot here that represents hullabaloo. 
and the reason that Odie is being bred to Calamity this year, despite his risk of throwing multiple teats, is for that slim chance that he could throw a two-teated doe with Calamity, it would really help diversify our genetics. A buck like him, I really wouldn't want to keep bucks out of because that's too many chances for that bad trait to get passed on. So that's why he's being called, but if I can keep a daughter out of him and Calamity that has two teats, there is a chance that we could breed out that bad trait, but there's also a chance that it won't work. Ultimately, I'd really love to keep a mini La Mancha buck that comes from Nefarious, our blue cactus buckling, and one of my La Mancha girls, but he's too short to service any of my big girls this year. I also think I neglected to mention buckwheat. Buckwheat is out of Christine and Hamish. He has a facial deformity, and so he's on our call list too. Hi, Tidy. You're handsome. But Talia gave birth to big old Breezy. The last time I put the weight tape around Breezy, she was 66 pounds. So she only has 14 more pounds to go before I'm comfortable breeding her. So we should be able to breed Breezy this year. We're gonna breed her to Feral. He is one of my new bucklings that I bought this year. And then last but not least, as far as the dolings go, or the does, we have Tori. Tori is a little F1 mini La Mancha. She's actually only 27% La Mancha. So she is itty bitty. She's a lot more Nigerian in size. She was also a triplet this year, so I am not breeding her. We're giving her plenty of time to grow a lot bigger. So down here we've got our list of bucks. I mentioned that we used to have barley. I wrote his name down here because he does have some influence up here with our does. We had Cash, who is Elpis's dad. We still have Havoc, and if I have anything to say about it, we're going to be keeping Havoc forever, no matter what. We have Hamish, who is a call this year. I'll explain why in just a second. We've got our new mini La Mancha buckling feral who is 70% La Mancha. I think it's actually 69 point something percent. Technically a mini La Mancha can't have more than 70% of the standard breed in their blood. We really need to keep that balance. So that's why combining him with somebody like Tori who has a lot less La Mancha really helps level that out in the in the line. And then last but certainly not least, we have our new blue cactus buckling, Nefarious. And I just put in Barely and Tempest with Nefarious. But if she happens to give me a doling out of Nefarious, I will probably call Barely because Barely's really not my favorite as far as Utter goes. She has a really hard time giving birth every single time. I have to help her quite extensively. And also she has developed quite the attitude problem in the last little bit. She does have horns and sometimes when a horned goat really gets a bad attitude problem. They can be quite a danger to people as well as goats. She has not been aggressive towards people, but she really has been getting aggressive with her horns as far as the other goats go. Goats will be goats, of course, but around here we just can't keep the truly mean ones, so. But anyways, Hamish. Hamish was new to the farm last year. He's a standard La Mancha, and I had thought that that's the route that I really wanted to go was my standard La Manchas, but then I started looking into and breeding mini La Manchas, and that's really where my heart is at. And you can't really use a standard size buck while developing mini La Manchas. Not necessarily the smartest way to combine the two breeds is to put a Nigerian buck over a standard size doe so that you have the doe as big as possible to be able to pass, you know, the hybrid kids. If I were to put Hamish over a Nigerian dwarf, a Nigerian dwarf would be asked to deliver a kid that is half La Mancha, half standard breed. And that's a lot on a little body. I do know people that have done it successfully. It's just not something that we're going to do here. So I have him called here because standard La Mancha just isn't where my heart is at right now. So out of the 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So almost half of the goats that are out on pasture right now are on my cull list. So when our nefarious babies start hitting the ground, we can keep them. So I only see the two active nests right there.
did manage to get all 55 bales squared away in here with a lot of room to spare. This hay right here should last about a month to a month and a half, kind of depending on the time of year that I feed it. And it also really depends on how much my girls in the big pasture over by the pond, how much they decide to forage. Last year, they really didn't go to the pond barely at all, all winter long. This year, I've decided to leave the field long, hoping that they would see that there's an option out there for them and they would go out there and forage. When you leave hay on a field over winter without cutting it, it's called standing hay. It's something that I didn't know about until last year, unfortunately after we had already cut our field down. Usually we just mow it down at the end of the year so that the goats, especially the little babies that we have born in the fall, they don't get lost and separated from the herd. But this year we are gonna try standing hay. Hopefully it works out pretty well. We've thought about buying some more collars and bells just to help the goats out. As I teased a little bit before, we do have baby goats hitting the ground in about a week to 10 days. A week from now, Mayhem is due to give birth. I think she's probably having twins, but hey, this could be her time for triplets. Who knows? 